being a, an institution of higher education, uh, we have to have our classes, our lectures, and today we have two distinguished uh, historians to give us some presentations. Uh, Lydia is sort of the, the Martin historian uh, and has compiled so much of the, the data that, that I used uh, in putting together material and the charts you see upstairs, and we'll hear more about Esther Green and her contributions later on. This is going to be interesting because all of us are, are part of this history, and uh, I'd like to invite first uh, Lydia, Dr. Lydia Martin, we'll give her a title for today's operation. Can you tell us a little about Benjamin Romig and, and the history of his family? Mm -hmm. <coughs> you know what, you make me feel like I'm reminded, is this it? Okay. I'm, I'm reminded of a little of uh, Jetty. You are old, Father William, the young man said, and your hair is turning white. And yet you constantly stand on your head. Do you think at your age it is right? In my youth, the, the old man replied to his son, I feared it might injure the brain. But now I am perfectly sure I have none. I do it again and again. <laughs> uh, this morning I was reading uh, a passage in Lamentations. And one word struck me very, very forcefully, and the word was tributary, which is used in the first verse of the first chapter. And I realized that we of the third generation have been talking. We of the third generation feel that we are the uh, the core of the, of the Romig uh, descendants. And this is not true at all. It is time for us to become tributaries and to turn the, the wonderful heritage over to the fourth and the fifth generation. Turn it to the young people. I'm just so thrilled to see all these young people here, especially the, the little, the young, really young people, and realize that we are becoming tributaries and they are becoming the mainstream. And we pray that uh, as we talk about the history and the, the life story of Benjamin Romig, our my grandfather, and the great great grandfather of some of you that uh, we may pass on not only the, the historical heritage, but far more important, the spiritual heritage that we are, have been so fortunate to receive. It also occurred to me that this man, Benjamin Romy, has been a benediction to really thousands now as I see the list of Romy's that uh, I saw this morning in one of the publications that, I, that was showing me. And we realize that Benjamin Romy felt love. His, his whole life was one of love. And he spelled love, A-B-E-Y. I'm going to read the, what I have this morning because I feel that uh, we need to conserve time. And if I begin talking, I'm afraid it will take too long. I wish to give you a very brief history of the background of Bishop Benjamin Romig and his family, whose grandchildren and great-grandchildren are here today. For some, it will be an introduction to our heritage, a very abbreviated part of the whole glorious history uh, heritage we share. Some of us have been researching down the corridors of time. In fact, we have family records reaching as far back as the year 1550, which you have noted on the Romic side, and actually to signers of the Magna Carta in the year 1215 on Grandmother Romig's side. We wish to share more later. In the Song of Moses, Deuteronomy 32, 7, we read, Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations, and they will uh, ask your father, and he will show you, your elders, and they will tell you. The end of quote. And the Apostle Peter wrote, Yea, I think it need to rouse you by awakening memories of the past. What a glorious memory we share. My purpose then is to witness to the faithful fulfillment of God's promises of blessing to all those that love and serve the Lord. Specifically, the fulfillment of blessing to Grandfather Romans' family. And I wish also to testify that his crowning mercies 
having indeed extended far down to his children and children's children. It is my earnest desire that we will all see the hand of God in this our history. And I pray that God will teach us how to use the knowledge of the past to more fully glorify and serve him in the present and for all the years of our lives. Now the year is 1834. The scene is the main room of a busy two-story inn situated on the banks of the Ohio Canal in the county of Tuscarawas, Ohio. It is the year that Andrew Jackson is President of the United States. Outside, the snow and wind are shrieking around the cold timbers, for March has come in like a lion. The travelers are huddled around a blazing hearth, their coonskin caps and deerskin moccasins thrown on a wooden bench in the corner of the room. A little three-year-old boy is trying to capture the attention of the guests, for he wants to share his exciting secret. Just then a long, lusty cry is heard, and a gentle Moravian sister comes through a connecting door to announce that little Alvin Cyrus has a baby brother. Benjamin has been born to the innkeepers, Samuel and Elizabeth Romy. Grandfather Benjamin was born into a God-fearing, thrifty, industrious, civic-minded, and public-spirited family whose forebears had come to this country in the year 1732 from the Rhine Palatinate in Germany. They had settled and become prosperous in Pennsylvania, and in 1803, the year Ohio was admitted to the Union, Samuel's father and uncles had pioneered to Ohio, settling as homesteaders on a 480-acre tract of fertile land along the Tuscarawas River. This family brought with them a living faith, which their father, John Adam Romig, had found in Emmaus in 1758. Like Joshua, the Romig family had determined, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And they had much to do with the settling of this Moravian community in Ohio. Samuel, grandfather, uh, grandfather's father, was the second son in a family of nine children. Joseph was one of them. When Samuel was in his early 20s, he had married and settled on a sizable piece of land one mile from the homestead on the river to raise a family and to ply his trade of saddle and harness maker. But when plans for the building of a canal began to take shape, he had very astutely, in 1826, added on to his log home a commodious two-story frame building to be used as accommodation for canal travelers seeking lodging for he saw an increasing demand for overnight and in facilities on the part of travelers going by canal from Cleveland to Columbus. And he seized the opportunity. In 1834, five years after the canal was opened, the inn was flourishing and famous. The civil engineer and two canal officials had already made the inn their temporary home. I might tell you here that much, much of this material I have received from the uh, uh, memoirs of Cyrus Romy, uh, the, uh, one of the uh, brothers of, Sam, of uh, Benjamin Romy. Our grandfather grew up in this busy, stimulating intellectual atmosphere with his three brothers, Alvin, Milton, and Oliver. Grand, uh, Andrew Jackson was one of the many notable political figures used, who used the inn. There was much work to be done around the farm to provide their mother with the food necessary to feed these hungry lodgers. There were cherry orchards and apple trees ringing the home on the hill. There were silver maple trees and beehives to care for. Ben's mother was known far and wide for her excellent cuisine. Alvin mentions in his memoirs that she was especially famous for her sugar-cured hams and her molasses saltpeter pickled beef. Every fall, <laughs> five to twenty head of hogs were butchered, and also several beef. And much of this responsibility rested on these boys. Those were the days of big men and big appetites, great stalwart giants, some of them measuring three feet across the back, and how they could eat. <laughs> this is what Alvin tells us. We are told by Alvin that one huge farmer, old man Lumpelchuk, with a big pond, would sit at the table a full three-fourths hour 
and get away with 12 portions of every dish on the well-stocked table, <laughs> accompanied by 12 cups of steaming coffee, all for the sum of 12 cents. The price Great Grandfather Roni charged his lodgers for a meal. This you can read. I have the manuscript, but I have a copy over here. During the winter, the four boys attended school in a one-room log schoolhouse several miles away. Alvin remembers the bunch of switches hanging over the teacher's desk. In the spring and summer, the boys had little time for play. There was planting to be done, cultivating, harvesting. In the fall, they would cradle, rake, and bind the wheat and other grain, gather in the fruit, and store the vegetables for the winter months ahead. Their father was often joining in a community helping hand, for in those days, each man helped his neighbor with barn raising, log rolling, husking, thrashing, butchering, or even fighting off the wolves, which were a threat. Fish abounded in the rivers. Passenger pigeons, pigeons blackened the skies and had to be controlled. There was not much free time, but the boys found occasions to steal away in the summer to fish, swim, and hunt. And in the winter, there was skating and toboggan sliding and games on the ice. But they eagerly looked for family events centered around their Sharon Moravian church, the love feasts, the Christmas candlelight services, the New Year's watch night services, the Harvest Home Festivals, the Sunday school outings, and the joyous Easter morning sunrise services. And in the home, each evening, there was singing, Bible reading, and prayer. But there was one activity which Ben shared with no one. As a small boy, he would frequently steal away to the graveyard behind the Sharon Moravian Church, and there he would kneel at the grave of a man he had learned to love deeply, and whom he may have never even seen, for Ben was just five years old when David Zeisberger died and was buried there. In Grandfather's memoirs, he tells us, this is Grandfather speaking now, he tells us that as he read there, as he knelt there, he first would kneel without any special emotional experience, but later with a deep and earnest prayer to God that he might bestow upon him something of the spirit of that great witness to the Delaware Indians. He would contemplate the life of this great Moravian missionary and would recall the heroic stories he had heard so often and of the many souls he had brought to a saving knowledge of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I can imagine that then in the hush of that cemetery did a great deal of listening, for conversation with God was with him a two-way experience. His brother Alvin Wright then was deeply pious and zealous and had a profound and unquestioned belief in the power of prayer. Then came the years when Alvin, his older brother, went away to school, to Kenyon College in Gambier, Ohio, where he received a degree in civil engineering and upon his graduation was appointed assistant engineer in the survey of the very important Panhandle Railroad. It was in his 18th year that a conscious spiritual awakening began to stir within Grandfather Romy. He tells us that at that time, Brother Holland came to, came to take over the Moravian pastorate at Sharon and soon began to take a deep interest in them, lending him many books for reading and studying. Following a revival experienced among the young people of the church, Ben was confirmed in 1854. A year later, he experienced a great restlessness. He had no desire to stay on the farm for his life work. His good friend, the Sharon pastor, suggested that he go to Nazareth Hall, a Moravian boarding school and theological seminary, possible field and the greatest possible protection. They sailed to a very lonely station, Sharon, on the tiny island of Barbados in the Lesser Antilles. Those are the, the Windward Islands. They arrived there on July 7, 1858. This was the year that the Theological School of Nazareth Hall was moved to Bethlehem. Here he worked together with a German missionary couple, the Buchners, whose son was to work closely with him many years later in Herrenhut, and who conducted grandfather's funeral in 1903. A year later, on August 17, 1859, they were blessed with the arrival of their firstborn, and they named him Alvin Fred. A little daughter, Emily, was born two years later in Sharon. 
Now, Grandfather Ben was asked to move to a station with greater responsibility. The mission board sent them to Cedar Hall, Antigua, in the, uh, in the Leward Islands, not only to pastor a church, but to teach at the native training school as well. Our records show that he declined being its director, but little did he dream that his son, Augustus, about to be born, would in 1900 reestablish this very school in Buxton Grove, Antigua. And little did he dream that still another son, Clarence, would become the director in charge of this important theological training school for natives many years later. And uh, the son, the daughter of Clarence is here today. I hope she's in the audience, uh, Helen Lauby. And now a second son, Augustus Benjamin, was added to the little family. But a devastating blow was to strike only five weeks after his birth. Little Emily, barely 15 months old, succumbed to an illness, bringing shattering sorrow to the family. God, in his mercy, sent them another little daughter two years later, in 1863, Mary Alice. And Mary Alice is the mother of George Howard, who is here today. Grandfather was to receive a second crushing blow. Grandmother Cornelia had completed plans to take little Mary Alice and the other two children, Alvin and Gus, with her to Bethlehem for a visit. This I get from the uh, American uh, archives. She caught a cold, and we don't know exactly what the, the nature of the illness was. I was, was talking with uh, George yesterday. And she died unexpectedly on February 23, 1865. What a comfort God's word must have been to our dear, heartbroken grandfather during this time of trial. In pastures green, not always. Sometimes he who knoweth best leadeth us in weary ways where heavy shadows be. And by still waters, not always so. Oftentimes the heavy tempests round us blow. But when the storm be loudest and we cry to God for help, the master standeth by and whispers to our souls, it is I. So where he leads us, we can safely go, and in the blessed hereafter, we shall know why, in his wisdom, he hath led us so. A year and a half later, God answered his needs. In October 1866, Mary Elizabeth, Cornelia's oldest sister who had been teaching in Bethlehem, felt called of the Lord to accept Ben's proposal to become a mother to his three small children to be his helpmate. A year later, Alvin Fred, the firstborn, celebrated his eighth birthday. And now a most difficult decision had to be reached. He was now of school age, and there were no schools. A key issue to the missionary then and today is the education of his children. We in the homeland do not always understand the problems involved. The heartache of separation is traumatic, both for the parents and for the child. How I thank God for our grandparents and for my own parents, for they understood the vital importance of building a lasting trust in us. They understood the power of prayer. We never cease to experience love and understanding. And most important of all, that which is the life-saving bridge between love and understanding, namely communication. We have in our possession packets and packets of letters written to our mother, Lizzie, from our grandparents, and I treasure these. And then I, we also have some letters from our parents. Please uh, read the one that is uh, on the table, which Grandfather Romy sent to uh, my mother when she was 12 years old and separated from her parents for the first time and separated by the great Atlantic Ocean. Her parents were in Herrenhut, and she was very homesick. It's a beautiful letter, and it's, it's, kind of, it's uh, on the table there. Uh, this one means has drawn us all together and unified us as a family as nothing else could have done. It has allowed us to sh all share freely our sorrows and our joys. We all today have a sense of identity, of belonging, of a common faith. And the circular, and by the way, the circular is on its way. That's a promise. And I didn't keep it. <laughs> oh <my. laughs> uh, it has survived fires, hurricanes, and two world wars. So little Alvin, age eight, was put on a ship alone, sailing for New York, in charge of a captain, destination 
his uncle Milton's home in Ohio. And I suspect that he was only nine when it was decided to send him to Nazareth Hall. And we have a, a, a very poignant picture of him in his Nazareth, Nazareth Hall uniform and Uncle Gus's uniform and how uh, George's mother, uh, Mary, in uh, one of the photographs that, uh, that George has brought with him, it's, uh, you, you should really look at it. It's, it's just beautiful to look at. Uh, Ruth Morse, Alvin's daughter, tells, uh, told me that he loved, this is Alvin Fred, he loved to regale his family with stories of that voyage from Antigua to New York. The sailors became very fond of him and made him a little hat, which became his lifelong treasure. Three children were born to Ben and Mary Elizabeth in Antigua, Emily, John, and Georgine. John's daughter is Helen Jeffries of Philadelphia. She's not here, unfortunately. And Georgine's daughter is Rose Drews, who is here today. I hope she's present. Now, the mission board asked Grandfather to leave the Leeward Islands and to sail to the Danish West Indies, to the island of St. Croix. It was the year 1872, and two more children of were of school age. So it meant another trip to the States, but this time, Grandfather sailed with Gus and Mary Alice. Gus joined Alvin at Nazareth Hall, and Mary Alice, at the tender age of nine, entered the seminary for girls in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Her aunt, Sabina Walla Leeds, became her surrogate mother. Sabina was teaching at the time in New York. Mary was to remain at the seminary off and on for six years. In 1875, Lizzie, my mother, was born, and in 1878, the year Josephine, the youngest, was born, grandfather traveled again to Bethlehem, this time with two more, Emily and John, and placed them in the two Moravian schools. Their stay in the schools was from 1878 to 1883. Now the family began really to be scattered. During these years, Alvin Fred had left Nazareth Hall to be with his uncle Milton. He determined to strike out on his own and left Tuscarawas to go to Kansas to study photography and to become a missionary with a Presbyterian church establishing Sunday schools on horseback throughout then Indian Territory, now Oklahoma. Mary, who had been staying with the family in Tuscarawas, was soon invited by her brother Alvin Fred to keep house for him in Kansas. In 1882, it was Aunt Georgine's and Uncle Clarence's turn to be brought from St. Croix to Bethlehem. Aunt Georgine was 11 years old, and Uncle Clarence, 9. Lizzie and Josephine were now the two remaining children in Freedomstal, St. Croix. Five years later, in 1887, a great honor and tremendous responsibility was placed on Grandfather Ronig. He was elected as a member of the three-member mission board, part of the five-member Unity Elders Conference of the Moravian Church, with headquarters in Herrenhut, Germany. The Unity Elders Conference was a committee of five in residence who constituted an executive board to carry out the decrees of the General Synod, which at the time of our grandfather convened every ten years, with representatives from provincial elders' conferences in England, America, Germany, and the mission fields, attending the Synod. In fact, these five men were virtually the imperial parliament and governing board. For grandfather, this was a most difficult assignment. It meant leaving the mission field after 29 years and setting sail for Germany and a new language and new culture. He had a very limited knowledge of German, having heard it only as a boy in Ohio. On the other hand, he was peculiarly fitted to understanding conditions and needs on the mission fields. Before settling, setting sail, the parents needed to provide for the education of the two youngest daughters, Lizzie and Josephine. Nine and ten. <laughs> From the correspondence, I gather that there was no small rebellion on the part of the girls. They wanted to accompany their parents to Germany. But wisdom prevailed. I imagine Grandmother Romy had a great deal to do this. She was a school teacher. Wisdom prevailed, and it was decided to send them to an English-speaking school among friends and relatives. I believe that both parents came with the children. Lizzie was 12, and Josephine, nine years old. The two girls were to spend the next four years there. Our, par our grandparents were very much loved throughout the West Indies, and it was not easy for them to leave 29 years of continuous service on these fields, 
Now he was being asked to help direct and carry out the policies of the mission board, which supervised an astounding number of mission fields and churches. If you think I'm exaggerating, you just go to that book. It's written in German. And listen, but I'm going to list them here for you. These are the stations listed by Bishop uh, Schultz and published in, in uh, 1890. The book is on display. Work on nine islands of the West Indies, including Jamaica, Lesser Antilles, Virgin Islands, stations in Greenland, Labrador, Alaska, Mosquito Coast, Suriname, Lapland, Russia, Palestine, Persia, Ceylon, Tibet, Jerusalem, Vienna, South Africa, Algiers, Egypt, Australia, and oversight of the American settlements in Georgia, New York, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and the West. This was the Moravian Mission Outreach in 1890. These were the fields grandfather had oversight. Our grandparents arrived in Hanwood on September 17, 1887, and they were to remain there for 16 productive and busy years. In 1890, he was ordained a bishop of the Moravian Church. How happy he would have been to know that a good number of his sons and sons-in-law were to become bishops of the Moravian Church in later years. Some of Grandfather's extensive trips to the field brought him also to the States, and I have records of his visiting family, family in 1890 and in 1895. In 1896, Bishop James Connor, who was the, uh, the uncle of Dick Connor, who is here today, the head of the Unity Elders Conference in Hanhut died. Dick's grandfather. Grandfather, wasn't it? Yes, yeah. yeah, not uncle, but grandfather. I'm sorry. Our grandfather was elected to succeed him in the position of gravest responsibility. He writes in his autobiography of his feeling of inadequacy, of his difficulty with the German language, of his wife's wonderful support and encouragement, and of his unshakable assurance that God would give him the strength according to his promises in his word. His health began to fail in the fall of 1902, and on May 31, 1903, he died in Berthelsdorf. He is buried in the Gottes Acker in the Hutberg in Herrnhut. Grandmother subsequently left Herrnhut to be with her two daughters in England, Emily and Josie. She died two years later in Haverford West, Wales, uh, with her while she was with Aunt Josie, who is uh, Dick's mother, and is buried there. When the Martin family were visiting Aunt Josie and Uncle Samuel in 1907, my mother was given one of our grandmother's dresses, and it is on display here. And now very briefly, I hope I'm not running over. I timed it at 30 minutes, but I'm afraid it's more. And now I'm coming to their nine children. Two more pages. Our own fathers and mothers, who are, were all separated from their devoted parents at such a tender age. What happened to them? It is an amazing fact. Every one of the four sons became either missionaries or ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Four of the five daughters became either ministers' wives or missionaries' wives. The one exception was Aunt Mary, who was married to a businessman soon after going to Kansas to be with her brother Fred and I have no doubt that she was a missionary too, a shining witness to Christ's love wherever she lived. Incidentally, Lizzie and, Joseph never met, and Josie never met their older sister, Mary Alice. What a testimony to God's faithfulness, to the firm foundation of faith laid by the parents, and to answers to parents' prayers. Alvin Fred, the oldest, rode the plains of Indian Territory, establishing and visiting Sunday schools for the Presbyterian Church. In later years, he was a photographer with a studio, I believe, in Wichita, Wichita, Kansas. Augustus, the second son, who remained single, returned directly to the West Indies for, the, for life as a Marine missionary. St. Thomas claimed him longest, but his most notable episode, perhaps, was his life in a most primitive condition in Santo Domingo, where he blazed the way for outreach. He served as treasurer of the governing board of the West Indies Providence for uh, province for 43 years. He built new churches, established a theological seminary in Niski on St. Thomas in 1885. He healed the sick, comforted the brokenhearted, and his integrity, his kindly smile, his love, his unwearied readiness to serve were known by all. 
in his obituary, which is on display, you will read that the whole island, we're talking now of Uncle Gus, the whole island closed down on the day of his funeral, and the governor and officials were all present. John became a Moravian minister serving churches in New York, on Staten Island, Houston, and Philadelphia. He was a member of the PEC, the governing board of the American, the American Moravian Church. Both Gertrude and I have a special, precious memories of Uncle John and Aunt Kate. For it was with them that we spent our first Christmas away from home, and many other times as well. Georgine, with her husband, Uncle Drew, served on the mission fields in Jamaica all their lives. Rose, with their daughter, is with us here today. George, their youngest son, became a minister of the Moravian Church, and his widow is here with us today, Harriet. Emily and Josephine were married to brothers, James and Samuel Connor, both of whom served in churches in Great Britain. Dick, Josie's youngest son, is with us today. He, too, became a missionary, serving for a good number of years in Tanzania. Is it 17 years? 16 years. For 16 years, he served as a missionary in Tanzania, East Africa, and is a present pastor of the Hornsey Moravian Church in London. Dick's brother Herbert, also a Moravian bishop, was one of the last persons to enter Tibet before its borders were closed to missionary endeavor. Uncle Clarence went back to the island of Antigua, where he and Aunt Sally had the directorship of the Theological Seminary at Buxton Grove. He also served at St. John, Antigua, on the island, and also, also on the island of St. Pitts. And after the war, Uncle Clarence passed through several churches in this country. Elizabeth became the bride of Theo Martin, missionary to the Mosquito Coast Indians in Nicaragua. Mother and dad spent 10 years on the mission field and another 10 years pastoring German-speaking congregations in Minnesota, retiring in 1918. One son, Gus, became a missionary to the Alaskan Eskimos, and one daughter, Grace, with her husband, Fred Brandauer, became missionaries to China and Indonesia and are now pastoring a church in Philadelphia. What a testimony to the faithfulness of God and his promises. It is linked with imperishable results. Time, which dims the memory of earthly efforts, brightens those of Christian champions, and eternity has in reserve for them honors inconceivable, but which are embodied in words which tax the highest imagination, the joy of the Lord. This joy was grandfather's and belongs to his children and grandchildren. We Romans have a noble heritage, not only in our grandparents, but in our... It's a thrilling, it's absolutely thrilling to look back on our long and illustrious story. It is a source of strength and blessing and encouragement. But we cannot simply live on the record of our forebears. As a generation that exists today, it is our responsibility to hold the record high, to see that the light burns brightly, and to carry on with the truth of the gospel which they lived and proclaimed. Thank you, Lydia. What a wonderful presentation. Huh? full of information and articulate and eloquently done. Thank you so much.